Urban Think Tank – це усе про неформальну архітектуру. Наприклад, про одне з досліджень наших спікерів наступних – Торе де Давід, найвищий у світі сквот. Словом, далі буде знов цікаво, ще цікавіше, відповідно, Готуйте свої запитання і коментарі. Представляю наших чергових спікерів Алексіс Калагас та Дієго Цересуело. Під ваші бурхливі оплески на нашій сцені. Дякую всім. Дякую за нас тут. It's really, it's great to be here in this, in this, con this festival. Congratulations, by the way. Um, well, we're Urban Think Tank. Um, our colleagues have been, have been here already in, uh, to Kiev, and we've been working with Can Actions for a while, and uh, hopefully we, we continue that. Um, we're so, so, so grateful, also. it's so good to be here that we already changed the, our, our flight. Now we're staying a, a bit longer, no? <laughs> Alexis? Okay, so radical design. Uh, obviously, we chose this as the, the title for our lecture, but we didn't invent this. Uh, some of you may know this image. This is from a 1972 uh, issue of Casabella magazine. Uh, and you see it, it was themed radical design. Uh, now, this uh, kind of came on the back of the late 60s uh, movement, which they called radical design in Italy, uh, which was really focused on being anti-establishment and utopian uh, and sort of trying to break, break the rules of architecture and design at the time. But we chose this title for our lecture because actually we want to think about uh, how we can, what is radical design today? Uh, th this is a photo from a, an exhibition that we did in Zurich that also was in Munich as well, uh, where we asked some of these questions. You can see down the, the middle uh, of the row there. Uh, and this is from an article in the catalog that came with that exhibition. So as I said, we're really, at Urban Think Tank, we're really trying to ask this question, like, what does it mean to be radical today? And how do we think about, how can we think about cities uh, in a, not a utopian way necessarily, but in a realistic way uh, and in, in a socially conscious way? Uh, and I think David uh, raised some, some of these issues during his lecture. Uh, but Urban Think Tank, if you don't know, began in Caracas in Venezuela. So the, the perspective of the office is really uh, one that came out of the global south. Um, and of course, that, that if, uh, if you're not aware, in, in Caracas, Caracas is one of these sort of classic uh, mega cities of, of Latin America where you have very high inequality, you have an explosion of informal settlements. Um, and, but this is something we see all around the world. The biggest growth in cities... Uh, in the 21st century is in developing countries and developing country cities, and particularly in slums. And so this is really the world which um, Think Tank came out of. Uh, but it's important to realize that this is uh, a situation that's global now. Uh, again, you might know this uh, publication by Thomas Piketty, but it was about the rise of inequality and how inequality really is the defining issue of our time. Um, he wrote about it from an economic perspective and you see this is showing the, the rise of global inequality, the concentration of wealth in a very small number of hands. But what's really important for architects and architecture and urban design is that inequality actually is manifested through architecture in a physical way, and it becomes uh, static and something that's much harder to change in our cities once it's there. So at Urban Think Tank, we really kind of challenge the profession to think, are we contributing to a problem that is going to take a long time to unwind. And so we, we're really concerned with issues like this, the right to the city, right to housing, right to infrastructure, resilience to disaster, safer cities, and also participatory cities. So it's been really great to walk around uh, the Can Actions Festival and see the kinds of projects that are happening here because it's, uh, we think it's really important that more people get involved. Uh, as I said, Urban Think Tank began in Caracas in, in 1998. Uh, we didn't found Urban Think Tank. <laughs> We're very happy to work there, but uh, it was founded by Alfredo Brillenberg and Hubert Klumpner. Some of you might know Alfredo. He, he I understand, dropped in on a session of the Can Action School uh, 
unexpectedly, but apparently it was a good experience. Uh, and as I said, it initially be began in Caracas, and, um, and they really tried to kind of question uh, what architects in, in Venezuela were focusing on at the time, and they, uh, this is a manifesto that they did in 2001, Manifesto No. Um, some of you might be able to, to read Spanish, but in general, the, it, it's uh, making the point that, that uh, architects are focusing on the, the wealthy and not on the poor, and they're not seeing the city for what it is. Uh, and this is, this is a perspective that they really, at first, they sort of sought to pursue through research, but then also in design projects. I'll pass to Diego. <laughs> Okay, so after the, those years in Caracas and, and also they were teaching in, 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 in Columbia University in New York, uh, I think there was a, um, a big change also when, when Urban Think Tank moved to Zurich in 2010. No? Um, there was a, a moment that, that we're having a big bunch of new sources and resources to, to work. It uh, uh, was also a possibility to link, to bridge these this two different worlds, uh, but also to rethink on how uh, all those uh, learned lessons, we could bring it in into, into research, into teaching, but always without, without uh, uh, losing the perspective of implementation. No? This is what we are interested in. No? So um, uh, at that point, we, we also thought, like, um, can we, can we uh, figure out a couple of methodologies on a, on a, on a way uh, that, that includes their practice, uh, university, into, into a couple of guidelines on how to, how to operate uh, in this global world? No? So obviously, bottom up and top down, that's, that's one of the main things that is important. No? I think we're seeing it here everywhere. No? Um, um, traditional planning has been always done top down. Uh, but we have seen that, that at the end, who leaves the city, who changes the, 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 the space, uh, are the, the, the real citizens that are on the ground. No? So I think there's also a transformation on, the, on this idea of the architect as a total designer into more a, a facilitator, no? to, to make transparent all those processes. No? And definitely from research to implementations we are, is, is the world that we, we like also to, to, to contrast in these in, in this things. No? Um, it was very interesting, the, the, the lecture from David before, no? No, was, was also we have a lot of things uh, in, in common. No? So, so also how, how to start to, to, to map and to um, exchange um, uh, things that are happening around the world. No? So, so we are creating over the years and by projects that we're doing, by research, uh, work with students also, kind of this urban toolbox that is, that is linking, is, fi is finding out that, I mean, every city has its own struggle. Definitely, once there are more and once there are less, definitely. But you can find operations and real implementations that have been worked. So uh, it's a moment also to learn and to and to and to move them uh, from one side to the other. No, we we use that also as as, as part of our our teaching way to 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 tell urban design, uh, not just from a chronological or historical way, also to to make uh, to to talk with the students have a. a one-to-one -one, uh, relation on what is happening right now, no? to, to map the, 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 the situation of the planet through different cities, through different tools. No? Um, the layers of complexity, obviously, this is um, super important because also, I mean, um, back in 2000, the late uh, 90s, um, I think architects were, were also kind of taught and as, as kind of to, to become part of the star system, which was very small, no? And, and, and also, the, the ranges, the parameters that we were talking back then, also with the boom and construction and everything, uh, it were kind of shortening a little bit the, the vocabulary of, of architecture. No? So one of the most important things that, that, that we believe is that uh, we are not in an exact science, definitely. No? So the, the infinite um, layers of complexity um, are, that are in our profession, for example, here we see the, the, the sustainable development goals that, that the UN uh, has created, you know, 17 points. No, we are not, there's not saying number aid architecture obviously no but but we are involved because because as david said also uh, this kind of the battlefield is happening in the cities no so so i think we're we're all here uh, under the same umbrella i think uh, probably urban design and, archi and uh, architects but at the end we are all citizens no um, so in this this complexity is very very uh, uh, important um, first to 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 check a look and and see that all those parameters are 
are, are uh, infinite. Uh, this we, we do also with our students and in Zurich, obviously when we, when we travel, when we go for seminar week also for, to, to Africa or South America, and they see that there's other realities. And that, that I think is, is, is very important not to, not to uh, forget them. No? Um, obviously, later on, it's, it's very important on how, when you're going to implement something, how you can create a hierarchy that more or less helps you to, to, to define solutions. No? Uh, designing time, um, it's, it's also um, quite crucial in, in our work, obviously. I mean, in the, in the diagram that we saw before, there was different scales, no? from, from, from the publication, from uh, the materiality of architectures, jumping, uh, going up in scales until, until the city, the, the, the city unit, the region, and obviously how can we inform or whatever we do uh, becomes kind of a prototype or something that we can use in other parts of the world. No? But the, 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 the most important thing is, is kind of this architecture that one of those layers of complexity might not just be aesthetic, it's also how it's going to perf perform uh, uh, during time. No? Um, uh, for this reason also to, to understand how can we create some, some legacy or, or think about all this, this uh, uh, um, having more value in one generation or even kind of one mandate of a mayor or things like that. We created uh, in Zurich also the uh, ISTP, which is uh, Institute of Science, Technology and Policies. No? The, the idea is also architects, we are, we are not alone and we shouldn't be alone. No? There's kind of a lot of other practices that, that are very interesting, no? like working with a lawyer, there's design included there, no? when, you, when, you, when you figure out how to, how to change some, some rules of the cities, rules of the, of the planning uh, uh, theories. No? We did, we, we created last year, uh, we did a, a no-cost housing conference uh, that was very interesting to gather also a lot of minds from around the world uh, talking on how um, that this housing issue that, I mean, Alexis will tell later uh, about Empower Shack in Cape Town. And, and what it happened, what the, the output of, of one of those events, uh, um, it's, a, it's the early con declaration. No? So we also kind of, in this idea of thinking about legacy, how can we let things that maybe the next one, maybe you, take it and, and still can put things on top. No? I should just add, it's confusing. Early con is where our office is in Zurich. So it, that's, it might seem like a strange word, but that's why it's there. Um, but I think the, the other thing just to add to what Diego was saying is uh, this idea of designing time and the reason we, uh, founded this urbanization research incubator at the ISTP at the university is this idea that you can achieve certain kinds of impact through physical design but you can also achieve um, other scales of impact through regulatory change and these kinds of things that have a, a reverberating effect in the in a city and that's why also even within urban, urban think tank within our office we we're not just architects I'm not an architect for example we have a mix of people who bring different kinds of um, backgrounds and different kinds of perspectives on the city. So um, after, after this, this kind of introduction, obviously the, the, the question is in an, an unexact science, how can we, how can we act? No? How can we at the end implement uh, uh, those theories, which is obviously uh, the a very difficult part, but uh, we wanted to, to bring today a couple of, of uh, different type of projects that, that we want to present to you. And we started with integrated infrastructure. No? Um, integrated infrastructure. So um, we believe in the access to um, uh, education, uh, mobility, um, uh, recreational spaces, public spaces. Uh, culture. That's definitely it's it's a must. And in very in many many of the of the uh, environments where we operate, this this is completely denied. No. Um, so uh, before uh, this, obviously, kind of in many places that are the density in in, in favelas, for example, in slums. No. Uh, how to find spaces? We 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 saw that there's also kind of in the in the size of a of a soccer field, no, like little futbito, no, or basket basket court, that we can operate in this in this in this um, space, no, that is always is always kind of protected, no, because it rep represents somehow the 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 public space, but it's not. Usually, it's, it's controlled by gangs, no. It's not that easy as uh, I'm going there to play, no. So, um, how to figure out some 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 type of prototypes? that can be implemented in every time that we've done one, there's obviously kind of a, a, another learned process, no? And this, the performance, the time will tell what are the, what are the key points that we should, we should adjust to, to be more successful uh, for the next one, no? 
Um, I think that's one of the, the most famous projects from Urban Think Tank. I think it's always interesting to, to, to go back because the impact was quite big. It's the, the Metro Cable in, in Caracas, Venezuela. No? Uh, so here the issue, we've seen a picture before also, that, that says kind of these two worlds co um, coexisting together. No? But obviously the, the access to the city, the right to the city that the people from the, from the right side, this is San Agustin, um, uh, it's completely different no? on, the, on the guys on the, on the left side. Um, and this is not just um, uh, a problem of how you, how you arrive, not the physical action on, on, on how you get there. No? It might be even dangerous in the rainy season. It takes you two hours to arrive to, to, the, to the school, to your job. This is definitely creating a gap of possibilities. No? Um, it's, it's also kind of the, here the, the pl local planning authority, obviously when, when we saw the mountain before, no? which is kind of the, 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 the house of the size of a mountain, it's like the, the first idea is kind of bring the bus. No? You have to create roads first at all. No? So, so that was their idea, uh, but this would have uh, knocked down 30% uh, of, the, of, the, of the houses that were there. No? Um, imagine also kind of the displacement of the people that are used to, to, to live with the, with the neighbors, no? This kind of cut the livelihood, no? So. Sorry, maybe just to explain like exactly what you're seeing here. Th this is how people, like everyone who lived in San Augustine, they don't work in San Augustine. It's, it's a slum that jobs are all in the formal city. What you saw in the, the last slide in, in the, the center of Caracas. So each day, they're going up and down these stairs, or they were going up and down these stairs to their jobs, two hours down, two hours up. Uh, and obviously it's dangerous, but it's also just a huge waste of time, and not, they, don't have, uh, they don't enjoy access to the same kind of services that other people in the city had. Okay, so the, the importance also on this, on this proposal was, uh, before even the construction is kind of the world was starting to look at these these places. No, I think there's also a, a, there is where research and when you when you are a bit noisy sometimes is is very important because because people might say okay we have to we have to check that out. No, um, I think at the end at the beginning the the local um, planning local authorities say rejected the project. But uh, UTT did um, a symposium at the, u at the university with, with um, um, community leaders, with architects, planners, activists, and, and the residents say, like, if we, if we have a, um, a better option that is more win-win, that the people from there want it, why not to implement it? So at the end, the, the, the local authorities say, yes, let's, le let's do it, no? Um, uh, obviously, it's not that invasive, like, like creating a road that is kind of cutting around the, the fabric. Uh, it will have just five stations that uh, not going just up and down, but also uh, connecting, uh, as we see here, down to the, to the existing um, uh, public transportation uh, net. No? So, I mean, this is, this is a, um, a, an important image, no? also because it's on the, on the top of the hill. And, and, and the inhabitants, they made it very fast their, their, own, their own project. No? When you see there, you see kind of you have your own acropolis. No? You, have, you have some symbols that so, uh, uh, your, your neighborhood is getting improved. No? So we have a couple of uh, images from the, from the inside, but yeah, go ahead. I mean, at the end, if you have happy clients, it's uh, even, even, even better. No? So, uh, at the end, many, many of those things and, and how to convince in, in this top-down, bottom-up, uh, the mayor is always kind of, uh, on one side is, is um, um, some people are interested in money, some, uh, some people are interested in votes and things, but if, if, you, if you bring some, some, some big, da some, some numbers that they say kind of, it was a win-win. No, so it's way easier to, to convince and get the things implemented. No, this is also kind of how to, after a project, to, to follow up what is happening with this project. No? And also, just to add, this is an example, I think, as well, of how architects can work in a very different way because Urban Think Tank, for this project, uh, really was an activist. Like, we worked as activists, and we put together a coalition of people. So actually, uh, the cable car... Uh, Infrastructure was from an Austrian company. Uh, Urban Think Tank by this point was, was based in Columbia University in New York, uh, and then working with the local community as well. So it was really a, a, an international partnership, and that's something, a lesson that was learned, and that we continue to kind of reproduce in projects now. 
in the vertical gym, the case was was more also kind of uh, how to um, uh, create some sport facilities. No, uh, as I said before, we have the the, the typical um, soccer or, or or basketball court that usually is in is in ba is a bad shape. No, so so what we what we thought we, um, with this proposal also is kind of um, can can we. Um, improve that uh, by going also vertical, add more possibilities, also uh, create a better, uh, some, some better um, uh, safety conditions because, I mean, nevertheless, th those spaces uh, um, uh, can, be, can be dangerous if there's kind of the, the gun controlling it, um, and, and, and actually create a, a space that, that is, um, um, that you, you might be even proud to be, to be that kind of your, your gym around, no? Um, Basically, in, in this prototype that has been, I mean, there was, uh, we saw just, just one, one image, but um, it was one implemented and, and now in total are four, no? all in, in Venezuela, but now we are also trying to implement a Colombian version. No? It's, a, it's a part of uh, a kit of pieces, architectural pieces, um, done as simple as possible. Obviously, here it's also a, an economic, a low budget intervention has to, has to stay, also to be convincing. No? Uh, um, and also uh, understanding different type of spaces and, and not just related to, to sport because at the end of the day if you, if you understand the timeline of the project during a day um, after school can be something else so for example the tatami to, to, uh, to do judo uh, is used as a kindergarten later no? so, so there's a lot of possibilities once you have this infrastructure no? This type of spaces, no, that I mean, in the part of the sport are, are related to, to specific heights and everything. Also permits, no, uh, for example, uh, the, the big space is, is definitely a community center when, when they when they have kind of the, the, the talks and, and and preparing for elections and everything, no. This, I think this just gives you a, more of an idea of the context where this was built. So, I mean, as Diego mentioned, this was built on the site of what was a, a very rundown basketball court, uh, which was wasn't really used as a basketball court, it was used more as a drug dealing spot for gangs. Um, so what, what the vertical gym brought was not just like a much better recreational facility, but it also brought something that was secure, that all the community felt comfortable using, and that, and that also gave people an alternative uh, to just hanging out at the court and, and eventually getting sucked into the gang life. I mean, more shots of the interior. I mean, obviously you see there's different stacking of different programs and uh, the ability to, it's a very multi-purpose venue. Well, with the ramp, I mean, you've seen also there's a ramp, no? Uh, if, you, if you would have had um, an elevator, it, need, it means maintenance, definitely, no? So the, so the ramp is quite characteristic in this, in, in, in this thing also to, to avoid, no? And there's, there's architectural tricks at the end, no, of design. It's not about how it does it look like from the outside. It's really kind of how can we maximize, no? It's at the end, it becomes kind of a gadget. How can, we, how can we do the most out of what we have? And again, I mean, there was very tangible impact from this project because uh, we're interested, obviously, in, in the function of the architecture, but also in, in the, the longer-term impact and whether it actually develop, uh, delivered some kind of social value for the community. And in the case of the vertical gym, there was actually a study done by the local mayor's office, and they found that crime in this area uh, was reduced by 30%. And, I mean, as you see, that it's, uh, it's very popular within the community and uh, a lot of... Uh, people are very happy, happily using it uh, repeatedly. And as Diego said now, this is an example of uh, an approach that UTT has of prototyping, and uh, it's been reproduced four more times in Caracas, but we've also been in discussions about the possibility of one in Colombia, uh, about the possibility of one in Haiti, uh, also about the possibility of one in India. I mean, this is, it's quite a popular project. Okay, we're also in, 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 in working in Colombia. We're, we're doing a, a big cooperation with, with the Swiss government and the Inter-American Development Bank to, to do a, a, what we call a Fabrica de Cultura. No? It's, a, it's a, the School of Art uh, in Barranquilla, which is the, the fourth uh, biggest city in, in, in Colombia. No? Uh, what is important in that is also working in partnership with Inter-American Development Bank. Uh, they have a, a so-called uh, Emerging and Sustainable Cities Initiative, which is um, kind of uh, giving some, some, some help and, and definitely uh, monetary uh, um, credits 
to, to cities, mid-sized cities that are growing very fast. No? So Barranquilla is, is, is one of them. They have um, also um, a, a methodology on how to approach uh, those cities. They have action plans. And then is where also we, we enter into that. Now, we've seen before a couple of diagrams. Might be a bit confusing. I just want to go uh, briefly into that. So, so wh what is also the role of architect? How can we, how can we uh, um, do some, some multidisciplinary, some uh, teams on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean? Um, so we are, we are working inside the ETH also with different departments. Uh, we have the, 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 the Swiss government, but also uh, we have a university from, from Barranquilla that we are uh, working together. Uh, and what is more interesting is that there's a kind of, in our, in our job to, to, to find out what to do or how to bring, uh, bring in uh, this action plan. I mean, we did summer schools, we are going there, I mean, almost every two months, also, uh, uh, and we study the markets, the, the, the avenues to, to find out what, can, what kind of projects should, should, we, should we do there or what is the, the best thing to implement. No? So one of the mo uh, most important things in Barranquilla is the carnival. There's the second biggest after Rio de Janeiro, and it's definitely enrooted into, into the, the population also. I mean, I think this, this, uh, the, the idea of also of the carnival is that uh, for one day, everyone is dressed, and there's kind of equality. No? The, the king would have uh, put himself as a, as a partner. So there's, there's a lot of, of, of very interesting things, but it's an event that is just related or as, as tourists might go just for one week. So, so it's also another opportunity on how to stretch that uh, as, a, as, a, as a work for the whole year. No? Um, we analyzed the city also to find out the places where to, where to uh, uh, um, implement or where to work. I mean, there's a, a lot of list of things and checks that we have to, uh, uh, how to, uh, uh, we, we can do be more effective and, and reduce the times, obviously, because in many of those things also you have to uh, enroot the project and the, and the partnership very fast. And I mean, very fast now, it's already four years, but I mean, at the beginning, there's going to be some conflict. And it's this, uh, very interesting that the conflict appears as soon as possible, the dreams conflict, so that they all know what is going on. No? And, and so we're working close to the, to the uh, avenue of the carnival, but most importantly, in a in an under, underused uh, historic district called Barrio Bajo. Um, uh, just quickly, we, we found out that there's a, there's a factory of, of, of tobacco existing there where, where we are, um, uh, all agreed to, to implement a project. No? The condition right now of the, of, of the people that are working also related to the carnival, which is not just that, we, we've, we, we realize that there's, there's a, a platform, existing platform of 25,000 uh, people uh, that receive some courses uh, related to, to culture. No? I think this, this absolutely in the Caribbean region, uh, uh, culture is, is, is flourishing in every corner. No? Uh, but the condition that they have right now, they have to squat, uh, to use places like schools after, after the kids are gone. No? So, so what, we, what we did with them is kind of, let's gather all together. We're still uh, identifying and keep all the satellites because uh, one of the important things is always proximity, yes, but give the, the possibility to, to, to gather all in one, uh, in one place. I think it's also it's interesting in this conflict that we talk, it's not everything kind of a, a fantastic trip and every, everyone is happy. There's this tension moment that I can remember with Gino Marquez, the, the coordinator, the chief coordinator also and and kind of uh, the sculpt, uh, sculpture teacher that I was telling you uh, why don't we do kind of open spaces know that, that you can kind of cross some some disciplines and at the beginning it was no I'm just the sculptural dude no so at the end the the, the guys from the the different coordinators they say why don't we uh, also um, um, cross some workshops no and have some spaces that we can we can uh, cross the borders between disciplines I think they at the end was was something very interesting too no um, related to that is obviously, I mean, with the access to jobs, no, and how to how to believe in, in kind of a, 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 an orange economy, no. There's a, the, the economy of of um, of creativity, no. I think there's there's also not just a a, a thing on how to how to uh, fulfill the the needs and the dreams after after work. It's also believe that if this can also be a way of living, no. So for us, in this sense, this is one of the our main pillar of the of of, of sustainability is the social sustainability, no. 
um, uh, where, where we are working at. No? Um, there's also obviously kind of the, uh, we, we analyze how schools work right now and, and with photovoltaic panels and, and controlling the water, we could also reduce uh, uh, energy consumption. No? Uh, nevertheless, we, we, we learn the, the, the lessons of Caribbean architecture and, and I mean the first thing is also be passive uh, and protect yourself from the sun. No? Just as a, as a quick explanation of the project, on the left side is the existing building. We create a plaza also, very important to, to gather many different uh, programmation and this is the this is the school no um, uh, I think it's important also to say that kind of this century I mean we have been um, um, kind of user consumers of the city now it's a moment also to be producers no and and with this we, we believe that the school of art can be can be very very interesting in the sense of a museum maybe you go more and see and check but in the school, there will always be ways to, to, to show that out. No? We will have also an um, auditorium for up to 500 people, and there's all the different uh, kind of spaces of the, of the building. No? Um, I, I would like to mention Habraken that was visiting, visiting us a couple of years ago no, at the EDH. He, he wrote this book called Supports. No? I think there's also where, where this idea of, of us uh, building some infrastructure, some, some, some type of, of, of the framework for something else happening. No? Time will tell what is happening there. No? They will, it's a school of arts. We don't have to design all the, all the parts. No? They are already thinking about how to go further and, and, and move, the, move things up and down. No? Uh, very, very important from, from the proposal is also kind of this is a pilot project, is, is, uh, the idea is to be replicable in different parts on, of, of Barranquilla, but maybe also in the Caribbean region and the scalability, no? so that they can adjust a little bit here and there where, what kind of uh, elements do they need. No? So still as a role of the architect, I mean, it's not that we, we are, we are away of the, of the design process. We are definitely uh, very involved into it. I mean, for example, uh, as, as part of this big team, uh, uh, this partnership with all the people, uh, we have produced already more than five, uh, 4,000 images and documents that we can, uh, we can have on top of a, of, um, of, a, of a table to discuss what is the design, why is, is this happening, why is this transforming, no? I think that's, that's also very important to, to, to go to meetings and, and to, to, to be able to show that the things, the things are moving. No? At the end, it's all also how can we synthesize all the elements and just take the, the parts as we saw before in the vertical gym is try to, to uh, as much as possible, not have to, um, too many add-ons that, that we might take, uh, be able to take out. No? Um, just as part of the concept of the, of the building was to turn it uh, inside out, so, so our main facade the, is, the, is the inside, is the, is the atrium that we will have there, that is kind of the, for, uh, at the beginning was thought um, uh, to be a white canvas uh, to be worked out with the, with the local artists, no? do an intervention of the building, no? so it's not just having a, a painter on the wall, it's really using the, 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 the building as this three-dimensional canvas. No? Um, in this world also, in this idea of, of, of um, working with, with the university, we're trying to understand better a little bit how can we, how can we improve a bit some, 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 some parts of the, of the construction process in the, in the big scale. It's a kind of all the, the concrete process and, and on this open infrastructure, but also how to work with, with local uh, craftsmen that are fantastic. No? In the Western world, is Every day is more used kind of a, kind of a catalog architecture, and I think there is definitely you have them close. The, the, you can go to their ateliers and, and, and do some 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 fantastic things. No, one of the other uh, techniques that we're using um, for the auditoriums, the shell of the auditorium, is done with uh, our colleague at ETH, uh, Philip Block from Philip Block Research Group that he has. No, that is a, a, a Catalan vault. It's a, um, it's a it's a technique that has more than a century. No, Guastavino know use that in in New York to to cover with domes big spaces uh, and now with with some uh, revisiting that technique with new software with understanding you just don't do um, the shells that can operate very well uh, under compression and, and and as a structural system but also adapted to acoustical uh, needs no so our Okay, so, so we hope to, to start this, this project that is trying to, to, to mix this new, old, uh, uh, traditional um, uh, culture, but definitely um, 
uh, also some, some, new, some new movements that are happening. I mean, um, I don't know if you know this, in the, in the, during the last month there's been uh, signing a, a, a treaty, uh, the peace treaty, uh, which, which is very important after 50 years of, of um, um, conflict. So, and we believe kind of this, that, uh, that education, culture can be also a catalyst of change, no? Not just for the neighborhood, but also the perspective on, on how to operate in cities, no? Okay, you can see this is a bit of a tag team <laughs> presentation. Um, but now we're moving, I mean, Urban Think Tank has done obviously a lot of these acupunctural projects where we focus on specific sites. Uh, but we also have started to move into other kinds of um, scales, and in particular uh, with housing, thinking about housing in a more uh, integrated and um, systemic way. So we're moving now from uh, Colombia to South Africa, uh, where we've been involved since uh, 2013, uh, and we have a project called, a housing project called Empower Shack. Okay, just a, a quick bit of background. Uh, I don't know how uh, aware you are of South African history, but obviously everyone knows about apartheid. Um, I guess in, in, a, in a similar way uh, to what you see in, in, in socialist countries, there was, um, although obviously with different goals in mind, uh, there was a kind of politicization of planning um, and the use of an urban space was really designed in a way to achieve certain kind of political goals. Uh, in this case, obviously, racist goals and uh, the segregation of different races in, in South Africa. Uh, and this is just a, a, a diagram that sort of shows some of the techniques and strategies that we used at that time. Um, basically, the city was planned so that different uh, racial groups uh, had to live in different areas, and then certain barriers were used, sometimes natural barriers like uh, rivers, for example, or uh, man-made barriers like uh, train lines or highways as a way, as, as a way to actually um, physically separate people. So it made it very difficult for anyone to bridge these kinds of divides. Then, of course, in, in 1994, uh, after a long struggle, uh, a new democratic government came to, South, came to power in South Africa. It's when Nelson Mandela became the first um, black president of South Africa. And... A lot of promises were made at this time, and in particular, oops, uh, you see here, housing was really kind of central to the promise of what the new South Africa could be, um, because uh, during apartheid, white people could have a lot of freedom about where they lived, how they lived, owning homes, all of this kind of thing, but if you were coloured, which is a, a term that was used in South Africa at the time, or, or black, uh, you couldn't own a home, you were forced to live in certain areas. Um, and so, of course, like after 1994, there was this huge expectation, okay, now that we have to find a way in South Africa to deal with these issues and to really um, bridge this, this uh, divide and inequality, and housing was the way that the government saw it was going to do it. But the thing is, more than 20 years later, not so much has changed. What you see here is the sort of typical... Uh, middle to upper class white neighborhood, predominantly white neighborhood. Uh, and then this is uh, a township. Um, it's actually Kailicha where Empower Shack is based. Um, and in the bottom half of the screen, you see a uh, typical informal settlement in South Africa, which is single story, often made of um, corrugated zinc and wood, um, various levels of quality, but none of them particularly good. Uh, sometimes you see double-story shacks, but not so often. We were particularly interested in, in them when we did find them, uh, for reasons that you'll see in a moment. Uh, but people live in very precarious circumstances. Um, they share communal toilets. There's no plumbing to these um, shacks. Uh, some settlements uh, have electricity, others don't. Um, and fire is a huge, huge problem. Uh, because when a fire starts in, in one shack, it will just wipe straight through the whole settlement. Yeah, more examples. Uh, and this is what the government, up until now, the government saw as the solution. Uh, this is a state-subsidized house, and uh, funnily enough, or um, not so funny, sadly maybe, it's um, based a lot on apartheid-era uh, social housing designs. Um, 
but this, the government's strategy was just to roll these out en masse to the whole population uh, that needed housing. You'll see that uh, they're very small. Um, there's no uh, thought really about public space. Um, and they're just produced, uh, it's like an identikit house. You, you can drive through one of these settlements, and they all look exactly the same. I mean, not just that, it's also kind of the, the, the proximity to, to infrastructure, no, that we were talking before. If you, if you, go, if you do a sprawl also in, this, in these conditions, obviously, I mean, uh, uh, they hardly bring a road, so imagine bringing schools or having the, the walking distance to have those things, no? Uh, but, but the biggest problem with this is actually that the, the government doesn't have enough money or manpower to actually build these at a fast enough rate. So uh, what you actually see is that since the end of apartheid, the number of uh, people needing housing that don't have housing has grown exponentially. Um, so right now there's a, a housing backlog of two and a half million units. And so this is the context for uh, Empower Shack because we visited South Africa and we saw the situation there and we realized that there had to be a, different, a kind of refocusing of efforts uh, away from just trying to build new houses and, and towards trying to upgrade the informal settlements because that's actually where most people are living. Uh, and this is just a, another quick illustration of how little uh, Cape Town has actually changed. It's still extremely segregated. This is in 2001 uh, and you see like the, the kind of black population is really clustered down here. What you don't see on this map is um, that the ocean is here and the, the sort of the um, services and infrastructure is all really towards the coast and so these informal settlements are away from there and uh, they're on these floodplains and so it's, uh, they're built on sand so it's really um, not a great situation and 10 years later nothing really changed. And so this is the site of our Empower Shack project which is uh, a pilot project what we, what, for what we're calling a comprehensive uh, upgrading strategy. So it's much more than just a housing project. One of the main goals is to build dignified housing because obviously what you saw in these other photos, um, there is no dignity in living in those sorts of conditions. Um, but we also realized, and I think David also sort of touched on this in his um, presentation that just building a house is not enough. You have to think about the whole system that comes around, employment, services, uh, public space, um, how a community has been integrated, etc. cetera. Uh, yeah, I won't dwell on this so, far, so much. I mean, like our other projects, it's, it's, this is definitely not just UTT. Um, we're leading the project, but we're working with a lot of different um, organizations and stakeholders from local NGOs to uh, national governments to the city of Cape Town uh, and many others. And EmpowerShack actually started uh, through our teaching activities. So we, we had a summer uh, workshop in Switzerland. Uh, we brought uh, a community leader over from BT Settlement. And the aim was to, to quite quickly in two weeks design a new housing prototype. And what you see here is, is some pictures from the workshop and then also the construction of that prototype which uh, happened in one day. It's kind of a guerrilla action in, in, uh, in BT settlement. It wasn't authorized. Um, we raised the money and just did it, which sometimes has benefits. Uh, and this, this was what, what the result was. So the biggest um, innovation that we tried for here was really just to, to go vertical, a bit like with the vertical gym to add a second story so that you can uh, maintain the same amount of living space but then actually free up a lot of space on the ground. Um, it was painted actually by the community in these, this uh, colorful pattern for Nelson Mandela Day and really it's the house of the community leader, Pemezo, and it became a kind of symbol there for, um, for what could be possible and, and it got a lot of the community really kind of interested in the partnership that we were developing. Uh, but then after that, we actually were able to use the, the publicity, I guess, from, from that um, and some uh, networks that we had in Switzerland to actually raise like a significant amount of money and turn this into a real project. And we did a lot of research and started to move in, in a different direction with the design. What you see here is, uh, it's a row house design, obviously. Um, but the really important thing is that we started to use different materials. So block walls between units, uh, so that, which are much more permanent. They're also fire resistant. Um, but 
they're also symbolic because people would never actually build their own shack uh, in Cape Town with these kinds of materials because they, they're too scared that someone's just going to come and knock it down. And there's this, this uh, problem of permanent temporariness. So uh, you, you permanently feel that at any moment you could be moved. And so we start to think about ways that you can, you can use materials, design, but also, as you'll see, other kinds of um, policy changes to, to change that situation. Uh, and what you see here is, is four of these houses that were built as a, as a second kind of prototype uh, just south of the main site. Um, these were built in 2015, and since then we've been uh, doing occupancy, occupancy evaluations. Um, also, a lot of the community has been able to see this as a kind of test of, uh, of uh, proof of concept, I guess you'd say, and we were able to learn from the experience of people living in these houses. Um, what I also didn't mention is there, uh, there's water access to these houses, there are toilets inside and, and bathrooms inside, so the quality of living of the, of, in here compared to what you see in the front is, uh, is not comparable. Just another view. And so since then, we've been working for the last year and a half uh, on the plan for the, for the entire settlement, which is uh, about 70 houses. Um, but as I said, it's not just about the housing, it's also about uh, reorganizing the spatial plan of the settlement to allow infrastructure to be inserted. Um, so that if, for example, a fire happens, the emergency services can actually get in because uh, what you'll see, what you saw in that initial aerial photo is that it's a maze. I mean, the, the only way to maneuver through that site is through uh, sort of little laneways where you can hardly even fit two people next to each other. And the third part is this uh, urban systems idea, so uh, which I'll go into a little bit. I think it's very interesting that uh, not all those layers of complexity, you know, that they start to, to clash. You know, if we will see just one unit, that's kind of the, the, through the eyes of a publication uh, 20 years ago on what is the architecture there, you might say, okay, guys, what is it? But the, the, the interesting thing is when you go through in this project, you know, that you see everything that is, that is being done, uh, uh, trying to, to improve uh, the, the minimal situation of, of the living conditions, but also kind of talking with the, with the guys that are actually implementing like 200,000 houses uh, in a row, no? and how this can, can also inform how to, at least this idea of going vertical, a couple of things, microfinancing. No? I think uh, this is just an example of some of the ways that we're working with the community. We do a lot of um, sort of hands-on workshops with them because when we are reorganizing the community, we want to we want to do it based on the kind of preferences. Like if you if you're living in that in that settlement, you have certain neighbors that you like, maybe others that you don't like so much. And if houses have been uh, knocked down, new ones built, people move it around. You want to be with your friends. You want to have a say in your community. You don't just want people flying in from Zurich and saying this is how you're going to live now. Uh, so we, we've done a lot of participatory workshops. Also, we've been working with uh, I, uh, in information architecture specialists at ETH to uh, develop apps and other forms of um, digital tools that, that facilitate this process. And so here you just see how some of these preferences uh, result in a different kind of plan. Uh, as I mentioned already, by going to two stories, it frees up a lot of space on the ground. Um, that space we, we're using in two different ways. One is to create uh, public spaces that didn't exist before. It was a very dense settlement. And also to add extra houses to the settlement, which can then be rented and generate income to make this more financially sustainable. Uh, the, it's not just a one-size-fits-all housing unit that we've designed. There, it's... Uh, demand-driven unit sizes, so you can really pick what you can afford, and also uh, if you have a family, if you're single, etc. And this is perhaps one of the, the most important things in this project is uh, when it's finished, this will be the first informal settlement upgrading project in South Africa uh, that has resulted in zero displacement. Normally, they would just knock down a settlement, they would move everyone to a completely different place, uh, and completely disrupt their lives. And what we're doing here is through a phased construction, which actually has just begun uh, last week, is that uh, no one will actually have to move away from the settlement. We also have some, some uh, other ideas behind this. One is um, this idea of incremental to compliance, which is uh, 
that you just start with a, a more minimal design and then over time, particularly when people feel that they're not going to be, that they're, they're more permanent and they're not going to be moved away, that they'll start to invest in their house and over time uh, they'll bring the house up to code and actually you'll be part of the formal planning system and it won't, just, it won't be informal anymore. Uh, this is just an illustration of how some of the urban systems ideas work. I think the, the most interesting one to note is um, what you see here, which is we have a, a solar um, pilot model that we're doing where we have uh, panels on the roofs, which will not only generate electricity for the houses themselves, but also additional electricity, which will eventually be sold back to the city. So again, it's another income generating aspect of the project. So this is our vision. You can see how it differs to uh, what's around. You can also see here the, the public space that's being created in the middle. Uh, which will have community wash facilities and, and uh, maybe it looks a little bit stark, but we're also, there is a little problem here that if you create a big space, uh, someone will just come and build an informal shack in the middle. So you have to find some uh, clever ways to uh, dissuade people from trying to do that. And also we're obviously very interested in how the settlement relates to the street and um, the use of these houses in a mixed use way. So for example, if people want to have uh, businesses that in the ground floor um, it's also another form of uh, community driven development I think we're probably uh, pushing time now so I'll just go quickly through here um, but this is just to say that also once we get involved in a place often our our activities start to spiral outward uh, while we're in Kailicha we we actually staged a theatrical production uh, with a community uh, organization there which was directed by Alfredo and out of that came another project, which is to build a new theater for the, for the community. So this will be uh, a shack theater in uh, nearby the main power shack site. And it's another example, I guess, of what you see also in Barranquilla of the use of kind of cultural infrastructure as a development tool as well. I've seen, um, we're doing a kind of a, a trip from, from South America to Africa, and now coming back um, also a bit um, to Europe, even though the city strategies that we saw also in the toolbox, they, 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 they're meant to be global. No, we, we can learn. Uh, there's not two cities uh, that are uh, the same, but there's some little things that we can, uh, we can learn on each other. No? And, um, I think from Urban Think Tank, what we, what we like to do is also, whenever we have the, 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 the possibility, also to do rapid actions, no? Because at the end, with those little implementations in small scale, sometimes you can also talk about and raise up some, some, um, some uh, discussion that, that might be a little bit hidden if it's just on a publication or not open to the, to the broad public space, no? So, for example, in Barcelona, a few years ago, we got invited to do a pavilion uh, kind of with the idea to be kind of a, a nice object and, and we we definitely try to to turn it ups and downs say uh, this has to be a playground a playground but all ages no cross ages so so that really the place becomes not a, a place to be seen but a place to 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 be performed in no? um, another of those those uh, things was a workshop with with students in in San Francisco uh, and the idea is it's a parklet is is parked on the street no this is not obviously not the first one but it's it's also starting to raise up uh, and the, the, the question of what is going to happen uh, in this verge of the new mobility that is coming uh, is the 21st century when we are going to, to, to reconquer the streets for the pedestrians and, 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 and soft uh, uh, mobility systems, no? And I think like kind of this, this idea of using the streets back to, 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 to public uses, I think is very def uh, necessary. And also what kind of animals no? or, or gadgets are going to populate the, the street, no? Also in, 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 in Zurich, we got invited to do um, um, an exhibition with uh, Moon and Yeon, a Korean artist. Uh, and we said, okay, it's going to last the show just two months. So uh, whatever we do here, we, we have to be able to, to bring it later on and do something something uh, outside the gallery, no? to not just stay there. No? Some, some of this, this thing is also, what do we do after an Olympic game? What do we do after an expo? No? I think we, we started, what do we want to, think, to do outside and how can we bring it also into this, this exhibition no? and work together? No? So, so we create a, a, also a, a platform. We, we said, like, kind of, we started 
started to analyze what are the rules of the city because many times the citizens, uh, we don't know what, what is happening, what is legal, what is uh, illegal, and also what are the spaces that, that, that are um, um, useful. No? So, so for example, the, the bike was just the idea on, on how to work with a truck battery that you can plug in a, a, a whatever you want uh, um, um, in the street, first of all, and also be, be with the possibility to, with wheels to, to, to run away no? or to move from place to place. No? Uh, with the tribunes that we did, the, the, the same happened, so uh, fast to, to fold and, and move it from, from one place to the other. I think that the was kind of very interesting how we, we, we kind of, uh, the people are taking over no? uh, of, of these things in, in places where we have lived, uh, the, the, the tribunes for a while. Um, we also used it at, um, um, at the university, but I think that this gadget has been very interesting and now uh, so some, some people ask us if they, if they could use it also as a, as a platform, no? Uh, they ch obviously changed it, it was the same idea as an open building was also the bike, was just an infrastructure, no? Uh, they took out all the, all the things uh, from, the, from the exhibition, re re reuse it, retune it, and, and now uh, they're, they're uh, going on tour around the city and probably this, this summer around Europe, no? What is it, well, just kind of to, f to finish that, is also kind of this space in between legal and illegal, no? When places that we, that we found out and we try to, to spread out this kind of, in the regulation sometimes there's, uh, there's some, some little gaps that you can use, no? And for example, they were saying for street musician, uh, if, the, if the police comes and your decibels are too loud, uh, if you move like 100 meters or something like that, you can still go, uh, go on, no? So, so what they did is just be a, a kind of rapid action unit of music that can, can move very fast, no? Part of the point of going through these projects, obviously, is quite a, a fast little review, is, uh, is that when we say city strategies, we, what we're talking about is not sort of urban planning in the traditional sense, but ways that you can use a lot of these little projects to add up to a much bigger kind of uh, intervention in the city. Um, and this is what we were looking at in our Reactivate Athens project, which was not a design project so much as a, a research project, and then uh, uh, a set of proposals for the city that were kind of meant to be provocative and uh, inspire action in Athens. Uh, also, we just published a book with Ruby Press, which uh, we gave one copy to the Can Actions Library, so hopefully you'll get a chance to have a look. Uh, but the context for Reactivate Athens, we got involved there in, in 2012, uh, right when the, the crisis was really starting to have its, its worst moment. Um, I don't think I need to go too much into this. I mean, this is in Europe, it's not in South America, so it's pretty close to uh, where all of us have been. Um, but I think that the important thing to say is that uh, economic crisis and social crisis, uh, it also leads to urban crisis in some sense, because uh, you, you can't not have an impact on the city. And this is where we really came in, because uh, we partnered with the Onassis Foundation, which is a, a philanthropic foundation there, to do a project uh, that was partly a participatory project to try and speak to the citizens of Athens to try and um, get their ideas on how they thought uh, the city could respond to the crisis in an urban and spatial way, but also to try and bring some ideas from outside, from, and even from the global south, which of course is uh, a bit like David was saying, it's not something you see. So often it was things start in Europe or the US and then they go to the rest of the world. And we were trying to reverse that a little and say, look, these conditions that you see in Athens, um, they're not that different from how Caracas was in the 1980s. And, and so therefore, maybe some of the things that you see in, in places in Latin America or elsewhere could actually be applicable. And this, these photos just show some of the impact on the city. I mean, you have construction that is halted halfway through. Uh, you have a deterioration in, in the sort of urban fabric. Uh, you have... Uh, vacancy, so you know some buildings you'll only have one or two occupants and the rest is empty. Um, but at the same time there's also, this is coinciding with a huge wave of immigration. A lot of refugees come in from the Middle East and from Africa. So Athens is really at this point of having its own crisis and then having to deal with an external crisis as well. Uh, and like many of our other projects, uh, there, is a, there is a link to teaching. We had a design studio in Athens uh, which was our first kind of um, entry into the city. But as I said, it, it led into a, a more sustained uh, project, Reactivate Athens, uh, which 
and we, we started this actually with a six-month pop-up RA lab in the city. So it was right near Ammonia Square, which uh, for those of you who know Athens, you, you, you'll know where that is. Uh, and we used it as a kind of platform to both reach out to the community, but also um, to hold workshops, to uh, get uh, sort of local architects involved in, in design exercises, um, to also target certain communities that didn't often get their voice heard, like immigrant communities, and to start to collect ideas from the people of Athens themselves. I might just skip this, this one. Uh, this is just to show that in particular we were focused on the city centre of Athens because this is really the kind of epicentre of, of the impact of the crisis. Uh, we, we, after, during the RA lab time we also did a lot of mapping and I think it's, what's worth emphasising here is we, we mapped a lot of uh, phenomena and, and uh, challenges that perhaps architects are not normally looking at. I mean vacancy, yes, it's something that, that, people, that architects will look at. Uh, but we looked at like distribution of immigrant communities. Um, here, it's not so clear from the map, but uh, you see this, this shows hotspots of drug use. It shows um, the main streets where prost street prostitution happens, also where children's playgrounds are. So you start to see how different elements of the city are fitting together and how it's affecting quality of life. Uh, this is the book that we... Uh, we later published, we, we went back to Zurich and took all of that material, spent another year working on these design proposals uh, and that and resulted in 101 ideas for the city. Uh, I'll just show you a few very quickly now. Um, as you'll see, the, the, these are not site-specific ideas. We tried to do things that, um, as Diego said earlier, are, are rec replicable. So they're things that you can use in different parts of the city. Um, the social occupancy policy is actually about uh, making use of underused uh, houses to, to house people that can't afford uh, their own housing and in return they'll provide services to the city. Uh, we also got ideas from different places. So this, this actually comes from something that is already happening in New York uh, where empty hotels are used as um, transitional homeless shelters. And obviously, in Athens, uh, tourism is a huge industry, but it was also hugely impacted by the crisis. So there are a lot of hotels and there's rising homelessness, so it makes sense. We also saw a lot of uh, commercial vacancy in the city, but at the same time, we saw th this new generation of uh, young kind of Athenians who were very entrepreneurial. They didn't think, like their parents, that they were going to get, uh, the state was going to do everything for them. They, they sort of lost faith in the state and said, no, we have to do it for ourselves. But it's also, there are a lot of uh, barriers to, to getting a business started, for example. And so we also tried to use ideas that were not actually about building. This is about changing regulations, allowing short-term leases that people can, can just get a storefront for three months and try something out. But it also has flow-on urban effects because it means that instead of having streets where there's no activity at all, you start to, ha you start to reintroduce street life. And also we looked at, uh, at existing things in Athens that we thought were worth highlighting because, as you said, there are young people there who are doing very valuable and worthwhile things and it's, they perhaps don't get enough credit for what they're doing. And this is an example of a sort of self-sustaining ecosystem within one building which involves... Um, spaces for creative startups, but these are subsidized by the programs they have on the ground floors, like a bar and a concert venue and et cetera. And, and these, these are really successful projects that are, are contributing a lot to the city as it tries to rebound from the crisis. And just lastly, we did have a few site-specific uh, proposals that we're now uh, speaking with the municipality about uh, implementing one of these as a test project. Uh, this one here is the, the square opposite the main market. Quite a simple idea just to add a lightweight, low-cost roof um, and embedded uh, stalls to have a street food market that could particularly integrate all of these different cultures in Athens that um, suffer a lot of discrimination. And then also uh, dealing with the train station, um, making it so it's not a barrier within the city, uh, elevating the tracks, creating a linear park and trying to really integrate uh, the different parts of the city. I think um, it's also uh, inspiring what we saw this, this morning, the, the results of the workshop that they were doing about how to transform, how to create this, this space, also a, um, a culture hub. No? I think congratulations also for, 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 
for you guys that, that did this workshop. So right now we're also moving in a, in a certain way um, um, into, into um, post-socialist uh, uh, urban transformation in the Balkans. No? And, and uh, we did also some workshops uh, with Can Actions, I think that, that inform in, in this Sarajevo now that was a pavilion uh, last year at the Venice Biennale. Uh, just to go quick, it's kind of um, understanding also some, some transformation. No? We were talking before like kind of what is the parallelism between many places no we saw Athens but this you could uh, you could read also through uh, places in Italy in Spain in Portugal no so can we also find some other connections no the 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 numbers of architects that we hear that the all this community that David was also talking about I think like it's it's good moments to 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 try to to share and and those ideas on on how to to talk to history, to what has happened, uh, uh, but also give this 24th century uh, low-budget activism. No, um, so I think this this is um, kind of um, the new part, uh, uh, and maybe hopefully also some some co collaborations that that we will create uh, uh, through this part. This was the uh, kind of the the fast proposal that we did for the the museum in Sarajevo. Uh, obviously, low budget. There's no uh, there's no need to 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 go back to this this Guggenheim effect in the in the past. No, we we I think like today and all the work that has been shown here. I think we're all in the same line that that we can, we can make it. No, I mean at the end there's there's some theory, but there's kind of this 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 moment of say hands on. Let's 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 start to do it. No. And this is also part of the, the City Action Lab that is coming. Uh, we will have the, the, the website also for that very soon. No? So I think... Uh, Maybe I'll just start here. I mean, we're very interested in, in uh, getting more involved with all of you. And this is actually an initiative that one of our colleagues, Harris Piplas, is leading, which is um, a Scopes project, uh, which is looking at Central and Eastern Europe. At the moment, these are the cities that are involved, but we hope to add uh, Kiev to this list in the future and this is a website that's going to be launched soon which will have a lot of contributions from people around the region so uh, if you stay in touch with us we'll hopefully have some news uh, and you can get more information once that site is launched thank you thanks Thank you. Uh, от хто перший або перший підніме три руки, які я побачу, перша вже є, uh, той і поставить три питання. Друга рука і третя. Щасливчик або щасливиця? Ну, uh, розбирайтеся. Третя рука є. Ваша буде перша, чоловік в кашкеті. Киньте в нього мікрофоном, будь ласка. Well, I think we talk a lot also, so at some point if, if, if we, will, we will stay here, I mean, and I encourage everyone to, to come and have a small talk and a conversation, no? Thank you. Okay. Uh, why did you use the word radical to describe your work? And to what extent uh, does it relate to the original movement it was referred to? Uh, good question. <laughs> I, as I said at the start, I think what, what we're trying to, to do here is um, sort of question what radicality would mean now. I think from the 60s and 70s, there was a kind of utopian counterculture meaning to, to radical, um, but often it was more conceptual, theoretical, and it wasn't really um, trying to deal and engage directly with the big problems, social problems of the time. As I said, we, with that context we, we showed at the start, there's obviously some huge problems that architects and designers need to deal with, and frankly we think a lot of architects aren't taking enough notice of those challenges and really trying to um, actively address them. And uh, that's, it was meant to be more of a provocation. Good morning. Please tell me, please, what is the project of the UR for the development of these poor areas? Who will finance this project? Как и в чьем, в чьей собственности находится земля, на которой стоят эти дома, которые вы перестраиваете? И как это люди финансируют, или это финансирует государство, или это фонды финансируют? Okay, 
South Africa. Okay, yes. I mean, in South Africa? That's, that's ah. another level question also. That's, I mean, we try to shorten all this, 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 wor this work in a, in a presentation that could be delivered very, I mean, fast of 10 minutes. It's a four years project. Uh, I think uh, that's exactly the layers of complexity, no? I, actually, this is, uh, raises a good point. So I think the story of how this project was funded uh, is a great example of what architects can do in a different way now. Uh, as you saw, we, we built this one shack, that colorful one that you saw. And then we did an exhibition in Zurich in a commercial art gallery, which you might say that's kind of strange. Uh, why would you do that? But one of the visitors to the exhibition worked for a foundation. They got in touch with us. They said, we really love what you're doing. Uh, can you tell us a bit more? And that turned into a four-year uh, grant to research and design the project. So it was a perfect example of how if you kind of uh, do something a bit activist and, uh, and provocative and then get it out there and by communicating it well, actually it can turn into a project. Hello. Uh, first of all, thank you for sharing your experience. And also, I'd like to thank you for arising this issue of uh, right to the city and special inequality because I think that architects are very frequently neglected of these all issues. And uh, I got a more professional question. You mentioned that uh, uh, the team of Urban Think Tank uh, have a mix of different backgrounds. And my question um, uh, concerns uh, uh, what is the background, what competences are needed to make such a valuable project and what competences will be needed in the future to do such a, such a job? Thank you. Well, I think uh, the approach is from different places, no? And, and I mean, we created also this institute to get even, even touch, even the, the policy makers, no? This, this thing, no? Coming back to the ground, obviously we are a lot of architects and urban designer, but we have, for example, a, a film crew also that is doing a, a documentaries and it's kind of going also on site because sometimes even if, if, if you do a publication or, or you post one, one picture, you're not telling a, 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 the whole story, no? So for example, there are film crew that can uh, do some interviews and, and to transmit that is very important also for, for other things like fundraising, like, like, like uh, tell the people what is happening down there, no? Uh, definitely the good thing also of having some, some resources around, around the university is that there's many different departments, no? So how to cross those departments too. That's definitely a, a, a something that is very project related, no? The, the, the depending on the task, you, you will create a kind of a, a, a group to, to achieve that and also then uh, look at what is needed and, and the, the people uh, local, no? the ones that are there, no? that they also build up their team and what is needed. They, no? That's the that's dialogue was very important. No? Thank you. Давайте гучно подякуємо нашим гостям з Urban Think Tank.